The Trump Organization just got nuked from orbit. It's not getting a lot of press, but this is a blockbuster ruling that just put Trump's entire business empire in jeopardy, and it's just going to get worse for him. And this likely isn't just some slap on the wrist that he can get out of. No, this looks like it's really going to hurt Trump in the place that he really cares about, his pocketbook. Now, New York judge Arthur Engeron has ruled that Trump committed financial fraud by overstating the value of his assets. The judge canceled the New York business certificates of all 131 companies related to Trump and his sons in New York, stripping the ability of the Trump family to do business in that state. And at the time of this video, the Trump group is currently in trial over the other fraud allegations. It's being presided by none other than the same judge Engeron, and it's not going well. Uh, it's a bench trial because apparently Trump's lawyer, Alina Haba, forgot to check the box to request a jury trial. She really earned that F tier ranking. But even before trial, the judge's order on the first count is catastrophic. And the repercussions from this are staggering. This is like bankruptcy, but much worse. And as you may know, the New York Attorney General filed charges alleging that the Trump Organization committed fraud for at least a decade involving conduct across more than 23 different properties and other assets. Uh, we did a video on this complaint, which you can watch for a deep dive into those allegations. But here's a quick recap. When valuing the Trump properties, the Trump Organization would change methodology on how to value the properties from year to year, or even within the same year, depending on who they were talking to. Some of the fraud was allegedly accomplished through sophisticated accounting sleight of hand, but other acts were blatant and easy to detect. For example, Trump estimated that his own triplex apartment in Trump Tower was 30,000 square feet when it was actually 10,996 square feet. In 2015, Trump valued the apartment at $327 million in total, or $29,738 per square foot. That price was absurd since at that point, uh, only one apartment in New York City had ever been sold for more than $100 million. And that sale was in a newly built ultra tall tower. No apartment in the 30 year old Trump Tower has ever sold for more than 16.5 million. And he allegedly, well, no, I guess at this point it's not alleged anymore. Uh, the, it's been proven that he used the same trick uh, with his Florida real estate. The attorney general said that Trump valued Mar-a-Lago as high as 739 million, when it should have been valued at around one tenth that amount or $75 million. Attorney General Letitia James said that the higher valuation was, quote, based on the false premise that it was unrestricted property and could be developed for residential use, even though Mr. Trump himself signed deeds donating his residential development rights and sharply restricting changes to the property. And the judge discussed Mar-a-Lago quite a bit in his detailed order. Here's a quick rundown because it shows how Trump uh, gamed the system and why he's in big trouble now. When uh, Palm Beach County, Florida denied Trump the right to develop the property, Trump established a conservation easement, which is basically a restriction in the deed that says he won't develop the property. That gave him a tax write-off because now he can't build houses or anything else on that property. However, Trump then told lenders that the property was worth a lot of money because someone could come along and development, uh, which was an obvious lie. It appears that he gave the conservation easement because there was nothing that he could do uh, with that particular land. And Trump's various business entities played these games with property valuation for decades. Uh, Ladisha James filed a civil enforcement action against the companies and referred the case to federal prosecutors in the Southern District of New York. So far, the feds have declined to indict Trump on these charges, but the New York Attorney General's enforcement action brought seven causes of action under New York Executive Law Section 6312. This law authorizes the New York Attorney General to bring civil lawsuits to enjoin repeated fraudulent or illegal acts or persistent fraud or illegality in carrying on, conducting, or transacting of business. Civil penalties for those who violate the law include actual damages, disgorgement of profits, uh, canceling of corporate certificates, and other prohibitions. We'll come back to that later. Now, Trump had already tried to get the lawsuit dismissed at an early stage by claiming that any discrepancies in the valuations of his properties are the fault of his accountants, Mazars, but he lost that effort on appeal. On summary judgment, Trump raised all the same defenses and that made Judge Engeron very unhappy. The judge wrote that, quote, defendants' arguments that OAG has neither capacity nor standing to sue under Executive Law 6312, and that the disclaimers of non-party accountants Mazars insulate defendants invoke the time loop in the film Groundhog Day. This court emphatically rejected these arguments, and in its preliminary injunction decision, and in its dismissal decision, and the First Department affirmed both. Defendants' contention that a different procedural posture mandates a reconsideration, or a fortiori, a reversal, is pure sophistry. 
So here's Legal Eagle pro tip number one. When the judge compares your argument to the film Groundhog Day and accuses you of sophistry, you're about to get a legal beatdown. Now the gist of Trump's argument here was that the New York AG wasn't really uh, acting in the interest of consumer protection. And this prompted the judge to call out Trump's lawyers for adding the word consumer to a legal decision that does not appear anywhere in the decision. As the judge explained, quote, defendants glaringly misrepresent the requirement of an executive law 6312 cause of action. Citing to People versus Nonum Leasing Systems, the defendants assert that OAG must show the practice is one likely to mislead a reasonable consumer acting reasonably under the circumstances. However, the word consumer did not appear anywhere in that reference decision and defendant's characterization of its holding is inaccurate. Additionally, Trump tried to argue that the state can't sue him because the statements of financial condition that he filed with the state contain disclaimers from his accountants that they haven't been audited and therefore the company can't say whether the financial statements comply with generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. The judge rejected this argument. Don't believe anything you read. Some people call it a worthless clause because it makes the statement and anything you read in the statement worthless. It says go out and do your own research. Go out and do your own due diligence. You have to study the statement carefully. Do not believe anything. Quote, those non-party disclaimers do not insulate the defendants from liability as they plainly state that Donald J. Trump is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statement in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. And that's extremely common. The accountants need that disclaimer because they're relying on the information that the company provides them. The company can't use that disclaimer to say that they weren't responsible for providing accurate information. Not surprisingly, Mazars dropped Trump as a client in 2022, citing his misleading and probably fraudulent personal financial statements. Next, the judge excoriates Trump for repeating another argument that several courts have already rejected, namely that disgorgement of profits is unavailable as a matter of law when the OAG has not alleged specific financial losses. Uh, the judge reminds Trump that an appeals court has already, quote, made it clear in this very case that we have already held that the failure to allege losses does not require dismissal of a claim for disgorgement under Executive Law 6312. Now, that's a big one because Trump, at least publicly, has been arguing that no one was harmed by his misrepresentations. The banks got paid back and therefore there are no damages. No bank was affected. No bank was hurt. They don't even know why they have to be involved. But this law allows the uh, attorney general to make the Trump organization disgorge any profit that they made related to these misrepresentations during this time period. And who knows, that could be a lot of money. And continuing with some truly F-tier lawyering, Trump's attorneys cited a case that has been superseded and overruled. And they also cited the court's decision in the Trump University case, where quote, the first department unambiguously declared that the attorney general is in fact authorized to bring a cause of action for fraud under executive law 6312. Now that brings us to legal eagle pro tip number two, drawing attention to a case that resulted in your client paying $25 million to settle fraud claims is rarely a good strategy, especially when your client is going on trial for more fraud. Uh, but here's legal eagle pro tip number three, misrepresenting the precedent and repeating arguments that you already lost puts you on shaky ground with judges. And as Judge Engeron put it, quote, in rejecting such arguments for the second time, this court cautioned that sophisticated counsel should have known better. However, the court declined to impose sanctions, believing it had made its point. Apparently the point was not received. And the court continued, quote, defendant's conduct in reiterating these frivolous arguments is egregious. We are way beyond the point of sophisticated counsel should have known better. We're at the point of intentional and blatant disregard of controlling authority and law of the case. This court emphatically rejected these arguments as did the first department. Defendant's repetition of them here is indefensible. And would you believe it? These lawyers then got sanctioned for thousands of dollars. Now there are two categories of conduct that can subject a party to liability under Executive Law 6312, acts that are fraudulent and acts that are illegal. The Attorney General alleges that the Trump defendants engaged in both fraudulent and illegal acts, but moved for summary judgment only as to fraud. And there's a very good reason for this. Executive Law 6312 broadly construes fraud to, quote, include acts characterized as dishonest or misleading. And the statute prescribes any acts committed in the conduct of business that have the capacity or tendency to deceive or that create an atmosphere conducive to fraud. Such acts include those committed through any scheme to defraud and those through misrepresentation, concealment, suppression, or false pretense. And in addition to the business entities themselves, individual defendants may also be liable for fraud under section 6312 if they personally participated in it or had actual knowledge of it as when they create an enterprise conducive to fraud through their supervision of the enterprise. And crucially here, the attorney general does not have to prove that an intent to defraud or reliance. This was one of the holdings of the lawsuit against Trump University that fraud under section 6312 may be established without proof of scienter or reliance. And we've talked about mental states on this channel a lot. 
some conduct can be illegal or legal depending on what mental state the person uh, has when they engage in that conduct. And here, a lot of these violations can occur without any intentionality whatsoever, which, you know, is bad news when you have proof that the thing has happened. Now, if your company ever gets nuked like Trump's, then you'll need a good lawyer. But if you want a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you've had an injury or death in the family, suffered a data breach, or are dealing with social security disability or workers' comp issues, we can represent you or find you the right attorney who can. Just click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. Link is down below. But now back to Trump's problems. And here, James has argued that the statements of financial condition were false and misleading. The Trump defendant said that they were neither false nor misleading because, quote, there's no such thing as objective value, and there's nothing wrong with adjusting valuations because of factors such as the value of the Trump brand. As the court put it, quote, thus defendants essentially argue that value is inherently subjective, that because internal brand valuations are in the eye of the beholder, here Donald Trump, they cannot be overvalued. And the Trump defendants argued that banks and insurance companies weren't misled because they never would have relied on the financial statements alone. As the court put it, quote, defendant stances, practically speaking, that they may submit false SFCs as long as the recipients know from their own due diligence that the information is false. The judge said accepting this premise would ignore decades of settled law that property valuation is objective, not subjective, and that market value is the most reliable way to establish how much a property is worth. Now, of course, there is a kernel of truth in the defendant's argument that the property valuation isn't an exact science. Uh, and experts can certainly disagree. And sometimes you have different valuations for the purposes of a tax basis versus uh, reliance for, uh, for collateral. But as the judge explained, the problem for Trump is that these were not small discrepancies. Quote, what OAG has established in many cases by clear, indisputable documentary evidence is not a matter of rounding errors or reasonable experts disagreeing. OAG has submitted conclusive evidence that between 2014 and 2021, defendants overvalued the assets reported on the SFC between 17.27 and 38.51%. This amounts to a discrepancy of between 812 million and $2.2 billion. Even in the world of high finance, this court cannot endorse a proposition that finds misstatements of at least $812 million to be immaterial. Defendants have failed to identify any authority for the notion that discrepancies of this magnitude demonstrated here could be considered immaterial. And that's why the attorney general moved for summary judgment, effectively a trial on paper, uh, just on one count, a standalone violation of Executive Law 6312. And to prove that count, the Attorney General only needed to prove that the financial statements were false and misleading, and that the defendants repeatedly or persistently used the statements to transact business. Again, here, there was no intent requirement. And the judge had no problem finding that the AG proved its case. The judge said that this was a documents case, and the documents here clearly contain fraudulent valuations that defendants used in business, satisfying the OAG's burden to establish liability as a matter of law against defendants. And the judge slammed Donald Trump's deposition testimony as well. Quote, the defense Donald Trump attempts to articulate in his sworn deposition are wholly without basis in law or fact. He claims that if the values of the property have gone up in the years since the SFCs were submitted, then the numbers were not inflated at the time. That is, quote, but you take the 2014 statement, if something is much more valuable now, or I guess we'll have to pick a date which was a little short of now, but if something is much more valuable now, then the number that I have down here is a low number. He also seems to imply that the numbers cannot be inflated because he could find a, quote, buyer from Saudi Arabia to pay any price he suggests. Now, I know the emoluments cases didn't go anywhere, but this is just a truly stunning thing to say when your international business dealings were already under scrutiny and you've received a lot of criticism for potentially foreign influence. It's just, man, uh, it's kind of like saying, well, it was worth it because Vladimir Putin would have paid me $5 billion for this particular piece of property. Just, it feels like the quiet part out loud. And not to mention there is a very famous incident of Trump selling a Florida property to a Russian oligarch at a hugely inflated price. But I digress. Uh, Judge Engeron also touched on the issue of square footage, quote, this court takes judicial notice that the Trump Tower apartment in which Donald Trump resided for decades, the triplex, is 10,996 square feet. Between 2012 and 2016, Donald Trump submitted SFCs, falsely claiming that the triplex was 30,000 square feet, resulting in an overvaluation of between 114 and $207 million. And the court agreed that, quote, a discrepancy of this order of magnitude by a real estate developer sizing up his own living space of decades 
can only be considered fraud. And the judge found that the attorney general unquestionably satisfied its two-pronged burden of demonstrating that the SFCs from 2012 to 2016 calculated the value of the triplex based on a false and misleading square footage. And the judge made similar findings with respect to the Seven Springs estate, Trump Park Avenue, 40 Wall Street, Aberdeen, and several other additional golf clubs, and Mar-a-Lago. And the judge found that Trump overvalued Mar-a-Lago by an establishing 2,300%. And the judge was unpersuaded by the testimony of Lawrence Moens, a supposed expert in Palm Beach property valuation, who estimated the property is worth 1.5 billion. When Moens was asked who would be prepared to buy the club, he said, quote, I could dream up anyone from Elon Musk to Bill Gates and everyone in between, kings, emperors, heads of state, anyone with net worth in the multiple billions. I don't know how many people in the world have a net worth of more than 10 billion, but I think it's quite a number. There are a lot. And in a very pointed footnote, the court said, quote, obviously this court cannot consider an expert affidavit that is based on unexplained and unsubstantiated dreams. So with that, we can finally talk about the staggering ramifications uh, from this order. The judge ruled that the attorney general demonstrated liability on behalf of all the named individual defendants on count one, including Trump, Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, Alan Weisselberg, and Jeff McConey. And as for the entity defendants, parent corporations can only be held liable for the acts of its subsidiaries if the parent exercised complete dominion and control over the subsidiary. And the judge found that, quote, it is undisputed that Donald Trump, through one corporate form or another, exercised complete control over the umbrella of entities operating in furtherance of or on behalf of the Trump organization. And the attorney general established liability on behalf of all the named entity defendants. When the litigation started, the judge granted the attorney general a preliminary injunction and appointed Barbara Jones as an independent monitor to ensure that there is no further fraud or illegal activity. And on August 23rd, Jones told the judge that the defendants had continued to commit the same acts. Quote, even with a preliminary injunction in place and with an independent monitor overseeing their compliance, defendants have continued to disseminate false and misleading information while conducting business. And this includes setting up Trump Organization 2, a corporate entity that defendants established in Delaware back in October of 2022, which looks an awful lot like an attempt to offload assets before the case went to trial. But with the corporate monitor in place, it's unlikely that they could have succeeded there. We'll actually see what happens with the details there. But all of this is why the judge dissolved the business certificates of 10 Trump business entities, ending their ability to do business in New York. The corporations are legal fictions, and when you take away and dissolve those companies, they can no longer own property or shield the beneficial owners. And the order includes, quote, any other entity controlled or beneficially owned by the individual defendants found liable here. Now, the Trump Organization includes about 500 entities, and although only 10 were explicitly included in this order, they own some of Trump's biggest assets, including the property at 40 Wall Street in Manhattan and the golf course in Scotland. Barbara Jones will continue to oversee the finances of the Trump Organization pending any further rulings, and obviously Trump is going to appeal here. And the trial is currently proceeding on the other six counts, falsifying business records, conspiracy to falsify business records, filing false financial statements, conspiracy to file false financial statements, insurance fraud, and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. And by all accounts, it's going very poorly so far. Expect to follow a video on that very soon. And uh, Letitia James is seeking at least $250 million and has asked the court to permanently bar Trump from serving as an officer or director of any business in New York and prohibit him from acquiring any real estate or applying for a loan in the state for five years. And the AG wants the same restrictions for Don Jr. and Eric Trump. And the ramifications of this ruling are enormous, with lawyers describing it as the corporate death penalty. The Trump entities are essentially in a receivership, which is a situation where a receiver or trustee is appointed to manage the entire company, its assets, and all financial and operating decisions until the companies are wound down. Barbara Jones is in this role right now, and the Trump entities won't be able to buy or sell anything without her approval, and there'll be a long process of figuring out which assets all the Trump companies own and who their creditors are. And if this order is upheld, the Trump Organization's assets will have to be liquidated to pay off all of the creditors, and the fact that these corporate entities can no longer own any property. And that means that they could be put up for auction and sold to the highest bidder. And there are many potential creditors here, all of whom are gonna get paid before Trump does, if there is even a surplus based on the sales here. And that includes banks that gave Trump loans based on fraudulent valuations, insurance companies, contractors, construction workers, service workers, uh, other vendors, and also of course the government, uh, who will probably want their unpaid taxes and any penalties and disgorgement penalties that come as a result of this verdict. 
And there is some suggestion that some or all of Trump's branding rights might have been assigned to a corporate entity and that the entity might be affected by the dissolutions. If true, and I haven't been able to drill down on this entirely, it could mean that Trump might lose the ability to capitalize on his own name and brand in some situations because they might be sold off to somebody else. Irony can be very ironic sometimes. So yeah, this is basically like a bankruptcy for all of the New York entities. Uh, not the fun bankruptcy chapter 11 where everything gets reorganized and the company continues, but the really nasty one where everything gets sold off for parts, the chapter seven bankruptcy. And there are a lot of creditors, including the government, who are gonna get paid before Trump does. But there are limitations to this ruling. For example, uh, Trump owns property in several other states and all over the world that will not be part of this case if they weren't owned by one of the dissolved entities. But that actually may not be much of a limitation because a lot of the real estate that he owns, whether it's in the United States or across the world, is owned by one of these New York companies. And if that real estate is owned by one of the dissolved New York companies, it's very likely that that real estate is going to have to be liquidated. And the thing about buying uh, these assets out of receivership or bankruptcy is that you have to have the cash on hand to be able to buy that property. And uh, at this point, Trump might be pretty strapped for cash. We'll see. The repercussions here are staggering and who knows what this is gonna look like. Now, if Trump's name, image, and likeness rights are sold off, then he'd really benefit from a company that can get his personal data taken down online, which you could do with today's sponsor, Incogni. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen a huge uptick in the amount of spam I'm getting, and it's no surprise why. Every year, the number and scope of data breaches worldwide is rising. And you might not know it, but there are hundreds of data brokers that possess and sell your personal information, and their numbers grow every year. I was shocked when I saw literally hundreds of companies who had my personal data. And these data brokers might have a whole shadow profile on you, including your name, your address, phone number, shopping habits, possibly even your social security number, all up for the highest bidder. And at best, this leads to scam calls, and at worst, identity theft and doxing. So for example, if you're getting tons of robocalls to your cell phone or calls from scammers like I am, like basically every day, there's a good chance it's because your data is online. And sometimes it's completely legal, but totally nefarious, like health insurance companies that raise your rates because they got access to your personal health data. But that's where Incogni comes in. Incogni fights on your behalf to remove your personal data from data brokers and deals with any objections from their side. All you have to do is create an account and give them approval to work on your behalf. And Incogni conducts repeated ongoing removals because even if the broker removes your data once, they can collect it again, which is just so dumb. And Incogni makes sure that your personal information stays off the market for good. And you can see when Incogni does this on your personal dashboard. This is mine. It shows that these sites had data on me that was rated 10 out of 10 on Incogni's sensitivity scale. Those brokers had data including my contacts, financial data, and health data. But thankfully, Incogni tells me when the removal requests are complete so I can breathe easy. It's terrifying to see exactly how many brokers have my data, but it's really fun to watch Incogni get them to delete that info one by one. So give Incogni a try by clicking on the link below and get 60% off Incogni when you use the code LegalEagle. Again, to get an exclusive 60% off discount, just click on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description and use the code LegalEagle. After that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.